welcome back to DBD TV, the offshoot of Dragon Ball Dissection, where I explore the elements exclusive to the television adaptations of the Dragon Ball story. This is not my review and analysis of this story arc. If that's what you're looking for, please first check out the four-part review of the manga because I'm assuming in this video that you already have. The TV version of the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai arc began airing on November 9th, 1988, just after Piccolo's arm is removed by Raditz in the manga. I suppose it's fair to start with the biggest elephant in the room. It's the production element this arc introduces that, to this day, is apparently the biggest controversy in the entire franchise, at least in my neck of the woods. This is the arc where Goku and Kuririn officially grow up. In the manga, this only meant that Toriyama's editor was having apoplectic fits over whether or not the audience would accept this new version of the main character. But in the anime, there was the little matter of the vocal casting. Well, Toei chose to keep Nozawa Masako and Tanaka Mayumi in the roles of Goku and Kuririn respectively, rather than recast them with adult males. And 29 years later, people are still engaged in heated debates on the subject. Well, at least in terms of Goku, I never really see anybody complain about Kuririn. I've never gotten why this is such a big deal. And no amount of, a grown man doesn't sound like that, thrown in my direction is going to make me change my mind. Obviously, the choices were between establishing a more realistic pitch for a man, or maintaining a consistent performance for the characters. Toei went for the latter, and I respect that. If they hadn't, it would have forced viewers to accept that these totally different voices are supposedly the same characters they've come to know and love for the past few years, including the main character, who has appeared in every single episode, and who has a very distinctive voice. While certainly not impossible, that's a big pill to swallow. I think we can all agree that it's fairly jarring when a character is suddenly voiced by a different actor. Like in episode 137, when Yanami Joji, the narrator, is voicing Kame Senin instead of Miyauchi Kohei. That's pretty jarring. But this way, Goku always sounds like Goku, only slightly deeper. Just like how pubescent males in real life don't get a brand new voice, but just a deeper version of what they already have. There's not the risk of some new actor coming in who's simply not able to recreate the same character nuances. It's unequivocally the same person. And listening to Nozawa's first lines in episode 133, I am totally sold. Every time. It matches the visual perfectly. It's a more mature Goku, but it's still instantly recognizable as Goku. I don't find it to sound at all traditionally feminine any more than it did when Goku was a kid. I don't recall ever having a difficult transition, and Nozawa wasn't the first, second, third, fourth, or even fifth Goku I ever listened to. By now, it's something I never even think about. The voice is just Goku, and Tanaka's voice is just Kuririn. This is about as straightforward an adaptation as they come. In the 22nd Budokai, the anime staff split the tournament across multiple days, leaving plenty of opportunity for original material. But that's not the case here, so I really didn't think I'd have a lot to say. But it turns out, upon doing research, that simply the fact that this arc is so close to the manga might be worth talking about. As I'm sure you're aware, the 23rd Budokai is the last manga material to be adapted before the anime decided to relaunch the series with a new name, Dragon Ball Z. Toriyama's editor at this time, Torishima Kazuhiko, gave an interview with Forbes last year. It is extremely insightful and worth a read, containing oodles of DB and jump-related info I'd never encountered before. In fact, so interesting was it, I felt the need to discuss it further on Konzenshu the podcast. The interview revealed there were some production troubles going on at the time, or at least Torishima thought so. He had never been pleased with the anime adaptation of Dr. Slump, feeling he didn't have enough control at keeping the TV series in line with the manga, and his displeasure continued through Dragon Ball. He claimed that the tipping point for him was Goku killing Piccolo, which he felt was a clear sign that the producer in charge of the series was treating it in the same comedic way as Dr. Slump. Personally, I don't see it, but it quickly led to some important staff changes, despite the fact that all this happened right as Torishima was stepping down as Toriyama's editor. He snaked two staff members from Saint Seiya, and beginning with the episode just before the start of this arc, Morishita Kozo and Koyama Takao officially joined the staff of Dragon Ball. Morishita shared planning credit with Shichijo Keizo, who had been credited for the entire series up to this point, and is apparently the producer Torishima claimed he could no longer work with. I have nothing with which to back this up, but I suspect Shichijo only continued to be credited as a courtesy, and probably had nothing to do with the series from this point on, as his name was dropped entirely once Dragon Ball Z started. 
Koyama is credited for writing the first episode he worked on, among many, many others, but he was also given a brand new title the series had never used before, that of Series Composition. I've mentioned Koyama before on DVD as he's the man behind the Dragon Ball Z movies. On the next DVD TV, we'll explore a bit more how this change in leadership led to the Dragon Ball TV series ending in favor of its successor Dragon Ball Z. But in a lot of ways, under this new leadership, this is essentially the first arc of Dragon Ball Z, and the name change afterwards is just a formality. If you need any more convincing, look no further than Ma Jr. taking the entire first act to power up his Cho Bakuretsu Maha. Literally, the entire first act is charging an attack. If that doesn't scream Dragon Ball Z in the way that show was paced, I don't know what does. Anyway, on to the changes. The characters' introductions are dramatized quite a bit more. In the manga, they literally just show up. But here, Goku, or this mysterious stranger still shrouded by his umbrella, is on hand to help Bluma retrieve a balloon for a little girl. For the other four, they zip onto the scene in a show of colored trails, but only after they've made everyone wait until the last possible moment before the registration closes. Sure, it's reusing the manga's idea of Goku running late from the 22nd Budokai, but what I found fascinating is how it hints at a divided loyalty among the group. With no other recourse, the group comes up with the idea of having Oolong and Puar transform into two of their missing friends and register in their places. Bluma suggests they transform into Kuririn and Yamcha. However, Lunch thinks that's unfair and would prefer Oolong and Puar transform into Ten Shinhan and Chaozu. I suppose it's meant to follow up on Lunch's crush on Ten Shinhan, despite the fact that she's known Kuririn and Yamcha for years longer. But I guess if I'd been in her place with Bluma making the decision so abruptly and with such finality, I'd probably stand up for those with the short straws, too. There's just a lot that seems to be under the surface with this scene, so it's a shame it's never really followed up on. Like the other animated tournaments, they register the night before and then get a hotel scene. It's two people per room, and I suppose I could go into what each duo says about their interpersonal relationships, but all the matchups seem fairly obvious. The only thing I find of particular interest is the attention to detail paid to Goku. Remember that when Goku takes his weighted clothes off against Ten Shinhan, he reveals he's been wearing them continuously for quite a while. And having Goku go to bed would have been all too easy an opportunity to mess that up. But no, Goku is clearly shown wearing his weighted undershirt in bed, but it's subtle enough to never notice until a repeat viewing. I'm quite proud of them. This also gives the anime a chance to do what they love to do best. Preempt character introductions. Well, kinda. I mean, we already met Ma Jr. before, but this is the first time we see his adult form. In the manga, we meet him at the tournament, when the characters meet him. But here, we see him the night before, saving a little boy from falling clock debris. I have no idea why he does this, since he's supposed to be evil, and it's not like he's showing off his power for anybody that matters to him. But it does look pretty cool. It's a bit confusing, but I'm left knowing one thing for certain. Ma Jr. hates model car kits. I don't know. I think that's a subtle dig at Toriyama. There's all the minor additions of the variety we've come to expect. Oolong and Puar break the non-competitor's rule by transforming into... that. And flying into the preliminaries just long enough to be noticeable, but not long enough to contribute jack squat to the proceedings. Yajirobe gets to bite his opponent on the ass. Why... Ten Shinon is given a brief flashback of his younger self being beaten around by Tao Pai Pai, which marks the only time we ever see a young Ten Shinhan. Yamcha is given a few moments where he seems to connect with the pain Ten Shinhan is going through. When Chaozu is taken to the hospital, his friends actually give a rat's ass, and Bluma and Lunch briefly accompany him. And when he returns at the end, he's given a close-up as opposed to the stick figure Toriyama drew for him in the manga. This must be the closest Chaozu has ever come to feeling love. Chi-Chi probably gets the most to work with here. When she and Goku get together, the entire gang go backstage to figure out what in the world is going on. During this meeting, the TV series introduces a nice additional callback. Obviously, the manga flashes back to the earlier Goku-Chi-Chi scenes, but in the anime, she remembers Yamcha as well in his pretend declarations of love, much to his embarrassment. In fact, the anime pretty much has Yamcha act as Chi-Chi's babysitter for the rest of the arc, as he's often pulling her out of harm's way or just huddling with her. But what I could really do without is Chi-Chi constantly screaming, goku Over and over and over again! I do find it funny that at one point Mutin Roshi suggests that they found the new lunch, which is pretty much how the anime treats her character. So you know how I love, read, hate, 
when fans look at that Sergeant Metallic scene from the Red Ribbon arc, you know, the one where it reads Alien on his optic display, and people are all, oh, it's foreshadowing because Goku's actually an alien and stuff. Yeah, I hate that. But, you know, I can turn unsubstantiated coincidence into conspiracy theories, too. You ever notice how, when Shen and Ma Jr. are talking to each other in their foreign language, the sky turns green? It's like Namek! It's totally foreshadowing that they're actually from a planet with a green sky! No. No, it's not. Don't believe that. Nope, no, 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 no. I see you going to make a comment about it right now. Don't you do it! I mean it! Don't. In the manga, the arc ends with Goku and Chi-Chi riding off to start their oh-so-happy lives together, with the tiny panel of Kame Senin breaking the fourth wall to tell us that the series isn't over yet. But apparently the anime's too good for breaking the fourth wall now, so instead we just have him wondering to himself if this is the end, only to get hit on the head with a coconut. That's what you get. You don't break the fourth wall, I break your head. But while in the manga, this was nothing more than a transition from Dragon Ball Chapter 194 to Dragon Ball Chapter 195, the anime was using this opportunity to draw to a close and relaunch itself as a new series, Dragon Ball Z. But despite the fact that the story arc closes on such a point of finality that Toriyama needed a character to directly address the audience to assure them the series wasn't over, that ending apparently wasn't good enough for Toei Animation as they decided to put in their own five-episode story to close out the television series. Goku and Chi-Chi return to Mount Fry Pan for their wedding, where Gyumo presents Chi-Chi with her mother's wedding dress. But just as everything is peaceful and happy, a fire erupts on Mount Fry Pan. Again. And to put it out, Goku and Chi-Chi must look for the Basho Sen. Again. Because, hey, the castle may have been on fire for a decade in the past, but this time, not only is Gyumo stuck in the castle, but so is the wedding dress! You know, even though it was probably in the castle last time and it still survived the fire, and a giant Kamehameha blowing the castle to pieces, but now it's really in danger. And that's important for some reason. Don't get me wrong, I'd slay a few demons myself to get my hands on that dress. But it hardly seems worth it to get stuck in a burning building for, and it seems even less worthy of a whole story arc. It seems they put the Ox Demon King in there just because they knew the dress did not serve as high enough stakes, but it almost seems like the dress is more important. These episodes are often referred to as the wedding dress arc, after all. But considering Goku and Chi-Chi are literally flying to the opposite end of the world and back over the course of five episodes, the repeated shots of Gyumo running through the castle clutching the dress devolve from tense to laughable to tedious. If he's not dead after all this time, I think he's gonna be okay. And since these episodes aired well into the run of the Saiyan arc in the manga, which introduced Gyumo's big old grandpa redesign, the anime gets the jump on that by including it here. But what is it that Goku and Chi-Chi have to do? Well, first they go visit Udenai Baba, who apparently agrees to divine the location of the Basho Sin for free, despite her brother's life not being at stake this time. Or maybe Goku beat the five warriors off screen? I don't know. Or maybe she's giving a discount right now because she's suffering from a cold and can't divine crap. All she can figure out is that it's connected to an octagon, which leads them to the multi-leveled fetch quest. I, I, I mean, Octagon Village. Octagon Village is apparently the home of Oolong and all the other perverted tea-named pigs, which would be an awesome chance to develop Oolong if he was actually in this episode. The fan isn't there, but there's a carving resembling a diagram in one of the Muten Roshi's books, so Goku and Chi-Chi seek help from Umigami. He finds the book, which says the feathers of the fire-eating bird are used to make the Basho Sen, that's just a bunch of crap Muten Roshi wrote when he was drunk. However, the scientist studying the bird directs them to Mount Frappe, and it supposedly has snow that can put out any fire. That doesn't work because, well, snow melts, but Chi-Chi finds the Basho Sin being used as a dustpan at the house of a woman who collects honey from bees who live in octagonal beehives. They return with a fan, but it makes the fire worse because the fan was actually originally used to stoke the flames of the furnace of eight divinations at the Mountain of Five Elements which just happens to be on the opposite side of the world from Mount Frypan, and the furnace is what is apparently causing the flames, so Goku and Chi-Chi brave the spirits of the mountain and get to the furnace. The furnace can't be turned off, though, because spirits use the steam to travel back and forth between the next life. However, through their quest, Goku and Chi-Chi happen to have the fire-eating bird eggshell and octagonal bee honey necessary to seal the hole in the furnace, which Goku does after using the Basho Sin to split the flames, so the day is saved and they get married. The end. Did everybody get all that? 
This is the most convoluted plot I've ever seen in Dragon Ball, and to this day, I barely understand a lick of it. I mean, it's just so convenient that their wild goose chase got them all the items they ultimately needed. But it doesn't seem like there was any real rhyme or reason to the places they went. I mean, you could say it was Udenai Baba divining them on the right track, but how? Because the Octagon wasn't supposed to be the village, it was the furnace all along. If Kame Senin made up the stuff in his book, why is it carved into the lake? Why is there an Octagon woman? Is she the Octagon from the Vision, or are the beehives? If the stuff about the bird was drunken ramblings connected to nothing, why did the eggshell end up being necessary? Why did the eggshell end up in a perfectly octagonal shape? And, and how does honey patch a hole in a furnace? It's all very contrived, but I just can't bring myself to hate this. It's all so charming. Especially in retrospect of what's to come, it feels like the perfect little breather. I mean, while I think if they were wanting to end this series, the 23rd Budokai was a much better fit than this story overall, the ending with Goku and Chi-Chi getting married and Udenai Baba hiding the future stories from us works pretty well too, and especially considering the new staff members have taken over by this point, it's amazing to me just how nostalgic this feels. I mean, this is really one last hurrah for the early style of Dragon Ball, especially given its inclusion of the Pilaf characters in Gohan. The story never feels as classically Asian as this again. And well, it makes sense considering the final stop of their journey is heavily based on Taoist teachings and Journey to the West in particular. The Furnace of Eight Divinations display the Bagua, the Taoist trigrams representing the Eight Fundamental Principles of Reality, as written by Lao Zhe, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing any of that wrong. In Journey to the West, a fictionalized version of Lao Zha, as the Taizhou Rokun, or Grand Supreme Elder Lord, traps Sun Wukong in his alchemical furnace, similar to how Goku enters the furnace of Anin, also referred to as the Taizhou Rokun. Not long after, the Buddha traps Sun Wukong in a mountain made of his hand, referred to as, you guessed it, the Mountain of Five Elements. So it seems especially interesting that after the staff member switch, they'd have filler still pulling from Journey to the West elements, similar to the Ginkaku Kinkaku episode. And even aside from that, I'm surprised they added so much to the mythology of the afterlife, especially given that this scene came out after the manga had introduced Dragon Ball's version of what happens after death. The warning about spirits stuck in this world fits pretty well given what we know about those killed by demons, so I enjoy a lot of this stuff. I also really like this swan song for Pilaf. There are some great gags with them. Their lack of recognition of Goku as an adult is pretty hilarious, as is the fact that Pilaf took his experience with Piccolo to heart, calling himself Mr. Pilaf Daimo. But most importantly, it's amazing seeing Goku and Chi-Chi work together on a quest. While Chi-Chi is almost uncomfortable in her subservient little wifey shtick, it's such a refreshing change of pace to see them get along so well. Chi-Chi is for sure at her most enjoyable here, and it's a shame we couldn't see more of this side of her. So while the stakes of the quest don't serve as the best conclusion for a TV show, the final significant callbacks to Journey to the West, Gohan, and Pilaf, whether they were intended to be final or not, do serve as significant thematic resolutions. As ridiculously contrived as the plot is, it's still a lot of fun, and I'm glad it's here. So, that's it for the 23rd Budokai arc. There will not be any Dragon Ball Dissection episodes in November. November's lineup will consist of a subscriber Q&A, and another foray into Mario RPG, so I hope you enjoy both of those. But after that, Dragon Ball Dissection December begins again, and we're looking at a lot of variety this year, featuring the beginning of the Cell arc and the fifth Dragon Ball Z movie. But the first entry this year will be DBD TV's first December appearance, with the anime adaptation of the Cyan arc. See you there! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.